even when the predictive models were wrong. Uh, I am a duck out of water. Uh, as the title suggests, I'm a non-modeling epidemiologist providing perspective on COVID-19 modeling. Uh, this is a joint presentation by myself and Dr. Angela Ulrich, who is also at the Center for Infectious Research and Policy. Uh, I take responsibility for all the mistakes. Uh, she gets credit for all the insightful comments uh, that might come out of all this. Uh, let me first of all start out by giving you a very, very important disclosure that I think you all should be aware of. I qu am quite convinced I probably know less about uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 today than I did six months ago. And so you can take whatever comments I have in that light uh, and uh, just understand that as we learn more about this virus, uh, I think we're realizing how little we really know about it and what it's going to do. Uh, the second part of this is I've already said I'm not a modeler. Uh, I understand the importance of measuring outcomes, of measuring incidents and prevalence and helping to give some guidance as to where this might go. Uh, that is exactly as, as Dan very kindly pointed out in my 2017 book, Deadliest Enemies, I tried to do, is lay out in a non-modeling manner how we might anticipate the future. So today, this presentation will incorporate a lot of that. It'll also give you a sense of the unknown. We started covering the issue of SARS-CoV-2 before it was recognized as such back in, uh, in December of 2019. Our news team uh, began writing articles on it, uh, even the one in the uh, news bit in the last week of December, this first uh, major article here on January 2nd of 2020. And my initial uh, concern was, oh my God, this is an influenza pandemic, uh, we're in trouble. And then in the first week, as we learned more about this and we understood from the Chinese that it was likely that this was caused by a coronavirus, there was actually a certain sense of excitement on my part uh, because I had been very involved with SARS as at that time, uh, after 9-11, I split my time between the University of Minnesota and uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, working as a special assistant for then Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson. And I was quite involved with the SARS response back in our country in 2003 and as well as MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which uh, first appeared in 2012 in the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, then uh, also I was very involved with the outbreak investigation uh, in Samsung Medical Center when an individual uh, came back to Seoul, Korea from the Middle East with MERS and uh, resulted in an outbreak there. Uh, in each of those instances, we were able to bring these coronavirus infections under control because the individuals really did not become highly infectious until well into the fifth or sixth day of illness. And all we had to do was identify them early uh, as a contact with possible symptoms, isolate them, and we were able to shut this down. So my next level of enthusiasm, uh, you might say, around this outbreak was actually a positive one uh, relative to, well, it's a coronavirus, we can bring us under control. However, by January 10th, it was abundantly clear that this was not the case, that in fact there was transmission occurring um, apparently from asymptomatic individuals or people in the earliest stages of their illness and led to then uh, the idea that though this was going to cause the next pandemic. On January 20th, I put a statement out from our center actually saying this is gonna be the next pandemic, get ready, we gotta move on it. Even as late as February 24th, uh, I wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times, is it a pandemic yet, saying now it is, we got to get on with this and understand the implications of what a pandemic is, a global epidemic of a respiratory transmitted pathogen that had basically uh, high levels of uh, infectivity in the cases we saw. Uh, it also, the virulence of the ability to cause severe disease was very high. Well, where do we go from there? Well, actually in the end of April, as cases were taking off in uh, various regions of the world, including in the United States, particularly New York City and some in Boston, uh, our center put out a CIDRAP viewpoint. Uh, this was co-authored by a, a number of other epidemiologists, including even John Berry, the author of the 1918 definitive history of the uh, swine flu epidemic uh, there. And uh, in this viewpoint, we tried to lay out how might this pandemic unfold? I, I had already stated at this point that I thought there would be, uh, in fact, I did that on March 10th, uh, one of those uh, back of the envelope calculations that Dan was talking about. And I said, I thought that over the course of the pandemic, we would expect to see upwards of 480,000 deaths or more in the United States. At that time, that was shocking to people. Uh, no one wanted to believe it. 
Uh, and as you now know, that is not even the, the full estimate as we're now over 570,000 deaths reported in the United States. That doesn't include all those we missed. Um, but in this, we tried to lay out, you know, would it look like an influenza pandemic in waves? Would it look like something else? It's a coronavirus. We didn't have history with that. So in this document, actually, we laid out uh, what we thought were three possible different scenarios, kind of a peak and valley up and down uh, with potentially some seasonality to it uh, that, uh, we, you know, we would see kind of houses on fire in various areas and have it come down. Or would it be more like an influenza situation where we had a first and second, maybe even a third wave where, in fact, uh, one of the waves was significantly uh, more severe in terms of, of, of the severe uh, of illness and deaths and uh, then basically become again more like seasonal flu? Or would this just be kind of a, we had this initial hit and then up and down and up and down and up and down. And we didn't really know. And we said, we're in a brand new uh, uncharted territory here in terms of understanding what a coronavirus might look like relative to an influenza pandemic. We know that influenza pandemics eventually lead to a new seasonal flu strain and uh, not the pandemic concept in, in addition. Well, if you look at influenza pandemic, something I've done a lot of study on for the last 25 years, uh, to the best of our knowledge, there have been 11 influenza pandemics in the world in the last 250 years, the most recent being the 2009 one. Uh, the onset of pandemics were distributed throughout the seasons, uh, winter, spring, summer, and fall, uh, and almost evenly distributed through each of those in terms of the first wave. Uh, as I pointed out, the illness was characterized by waves of illness and eventually became part of the seasonal flu picture. Um, the severity of first or second waves uh, were not determined by which season they started in. Uh, as we've seen even in uh, the uh, situation with 2009 and in the 1918 pandemics, both of those had spring waves in a sense, and then more severe waves in late summer, early fall. Uh, very different than we would expect to see with uh, seasonal flu. In the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, for which we now had substantial data, it resulted in uh, the absence of other influenza viruses and respiratory pathogens worldwide. Remarkable so, such that, uh, as you'll see in a moment, other than H1N1, uh, there were no other flu viruses circulating around. We saw a respiratory syncytial virus, these other ones basically dropped off the map. Isn't that interesting? Because I'm going to come back to that later when it comes to coronaviruses and this pandemic and what that means. This is what the 1918 pandemic looked like in, uh, in this case worldwide, but most notably <clears throat> in North America. We saw in the early spring to late spring, a first initial wave of what was relatively mild illness. Uh, the virus at that point uh, was not the lethal virus that we saw later in the fall, early winter of 1918. Uh, the one that is really considered the severe wave. However, there was also a very severe wave in 1919 the incidence wasn't as high, but uh, still the case fatality rate was substantial. And, uh, and so it doesn't mean that uh, it comes and goes uh, in one wave only in severe illness, but in this case, uh, even in flu, uh, 1918, it was both. I want to point out to you also, remember, there was almost no mitigation done uh, in 1918. Some cities did do some masking, et cetera, but many, many individuals did nothing. And yet you can see how the case numbers went up and went down by mother nature's hands, not by the hands of man. If you look at what happened in April of 2009 with H1N1, uh, at that point uh, on, the April, on April 26, we had 38 cases reported globally, 18 of them in Mexico, 20 in the US. Clearly it was a reporting artifact. We know there were many more out there, but the recognition of this uh, H1N1 emerging in central Mexico uh, and spreading around the world was marked here. Remember April 26, here we are just one month later, it's now in 48 countries with kind of confirmation of 13,398 cases. And we know that that was a major underreport. But you can see how quickly this spread around the world. Uh, there was no intent uh, or a design in terms of mitigation that would have lowered uh, the likelihood of transmission. Uh, we did not stop air travel. Uh, we did not close borders. And this is what we saw, how quickly this unfolded. Now, if you look at what happened in 2009, and I show this because I think it's instructive as we look at the issue of the coronaviruses and particularly this uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. 
As you look at weeks here, you can see in up to the week 20 in 2009. These are reporting weeks. So the first week of January is week one, second week, week two. And there you can see the classic seasonal picture of where H1 uh, strains were prevalent, as were H3, and that uh, the H1s typically at that time were not subtyped. The lighter color there is A, and then the hash box are B. And this was actually a year where uh, through the mid to late winter, we actually saw almost equal A and B activity. And then remember, along comes this new H1N1 from Mexico. And you can see rather quickly the, uh, the increase in cases in that first wave into uh, the period of, of, of late April, May, and early June. And if you look at the solid line, this is the percent of specimens positive uh, that went up notably uh, from that period in April up through that first part. But look what was happening by July. The case numbers were coming down even for uh, uh, 2009 H1N1. Uh, the other isolates at that point were type A's, not test subtesting, not subtyping, not performed. We think oh, virtually all of these were uh, 2009 H1N1. And then you can see what happened was this mounting peak that occurred in late summer and early fall. And there the case numbers rose precipitously. We know that these are again major underreporting, but you can see almost 50% of the specimens submitted in flu-like illness were in fact uh, uh, the H1N1 2009 pandemic strain, surely out of season. This is not when you expect to see a flu uh, 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 epidemic in North America, for that matter, much of the world. And then cases came down and they started falling remarkably quickly well before vaccination arrived in the United States. I'll show you that in a moment. The thing to note here is through the following part of that year, uh, in 2009 and 10, which would be the classic flu season from late fall to, uh, to mid-spring, virtually an absence of any other vir uh, influenza activity at all. Bs, uh, H3N2 disappeared. We don't know why. There was no human mitigation going on. Nobody was distancing. We weren't closing down businesses. We weren't restricting traffic. We weren't masking anything. And yet this is what Mother Nature does. This is a slide from our work in which we actually looked at influenza-like illness surveillance from the CDC, which is, in this case, a really good marker for actual flu activity. And you can see uh, on the right side the percent of visits for influenza-like illness, and that is the blue line. And you can see it peaking in mid to late October and then coming down precipitously. But look at the number of vaccine doses shipped and administered. Even if you look at the end of November, if you look at the cumulative doses of vaccine, only about 40 million doses had been at that point uh, administered, uh, a very small percentage in this country. Uh, and be, uh, and as with kids, two doses, you can see what happened here in terms of actually looking at the, the number of doses because kids got a lot of these. So it was far fewer than 40 million people vaccinated. This virus started receding in activity long before vaccine arrived. Vaccine was late to the uh, game here. It was late to the game in 1957. It was late to the game in 1968. In each instance, that big wave basically eliminated itself. What's going on and why? We don't know. I mentioned before uh, these pandemics, and I think that this is just an instructive lesson to say, you know, if, if uh, a virus uh, can, in fact, reduce the likelihood of, of uh, other pathogens being present, why? You know, I've heard a lot of people talking about how masking and current mitigation strategies have driven down uh, influenza activity in both the Southern and Northern hemispheres over the course of the last year, how it has driven other respiratory pathogens down to new lows in terms of occurrence. Let me remind you in 2009, influenza did the same thing when nobody was doing any kind of mitigation. So we have to be very careful about making the assumption that mitigation of itself did it, or did Mother Nature do it? And I've seen a number of models which make uh, substantial assumptions about mitigation having impact on, on these pathogens. So here we are today looking at the issue of, uh, of newer reported cases. And as you can see here, uh, let me just quickly go through this in, in what is obviously a very highly summarized way of cases. There are a number of many, many epidemics inside of this curve, M-A-N-Y, M-I-N-I. And I'm very careful to say M-I-N-I -I doesn't mean that they were small as such, but relative to the big pandemic in the United States, they were. 
These are the numbers from uh, uh, the United States here. And what you can see here with this is in fact, this peak initially occurred in April. And it doesn't appear to be quite a peak as it shows up if you actually have a much higher resolution. But in the middle of April, we saw house on fire activities in uh, Boston, uh, New York, Chicago, Atlanta, uh, New Orleans, uh, Detroit, uh, Southern California, and the Northwest. And we got to about 32,000 cases a day reported uh, in some of those days. And this was like, oh my, this is a house on fire event. How can this happen? And uh, it was a situation where uh, we thought this was about as bad as it could get. And then cases gradually were reduced uh, there, you can say from mitigation, whatever reasons why, uh, in these very localized areas. It was at this time we put in place many of the public health non-pharmaceutical intervention activities, distancing, closing schools, where, you know, this type of thing. But for much of the country, there was virtually no activity whatsoever. It was these hot spots, just as it was worldwide. Uh, look at Italy. The Lombardy region of Italy was a house on fire. Most of the rest of the country had very little activity at all. Well, then what happened is we got to our Memorial Day uh, to the or last week of May and June, we started to see a general rise in cases, but this time it occurred almost primarily in the Southern Sun Belt states from California to Georgia. And case numbers rose precipitously through that early period of August, such that uh, in, in uh, late July, we actually got up to over 70,000 cases on some of the days. Uh, and it was a house on fire event in the Southern Sun Belt states, almost no, very limited activity occurring in the rest of the country. And then cases came down again. Uh, this time, by the time we got to the uh, late, uh, or to early to late September, cases receded. We got down to as low as 26,000 cases reported per day. And then all of a sudden in the upper Midwest, the states of North and South Dakota, uh, Iowa, Nebraska, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, we saw this big increase in cases. And since we're only about 12% of the U.S. population here, clearly even a big increase there didn't mean that there was a great increase occurring. But in fact, because of the incidents, yeah, we did have a big increase. Uh, if you look, uh, uh, there were a number of days where North and South Dakota, two states uh, with very low populations overall, were, had the highest incidence in the world. So that in fact, by uh, November 20th, we hit 200,000 cases a day in this country, of which was driven largely by the upper Midwest, uh, many of those. And then those numbers started to fade uh, as we got into December coming down to about 160,000 cases in some days, and then a whole new peak took off after the holidays. Guess what? This time it was the Southern Sun Belt states again. They lit up literally from California to uh, Georgia uh, into South Carolina. The one exception was New Mexico, which we saw very little activity relative to what they'd had before. We don't know why. And then we hit this peak of 300,000 cases a day on January 8th. So we've had a whole series of adjusting baselines. You know, at one point, 32,000 cases was house on fire, 20,000 cases was coming down. Then we get to 70,000, and then we get down to 26,000 cases coming down. And then we get up to 200,000 cases, and we come back down to 150,000 cases coming down, and then look what happens again. Each of these were fueled by regional outbreaks that we don't understand why. We, we cannot tell you. If you tell me it was seasonality uh, in, in the south in July, and then again in, in December, January, why would you call it seasonality? You can say maybe they were indoors because of too hot a weather or too cold a weather. I think that's a hard one to acknowledge, particularly when you look at what's happening around the world in both Northern and Southern hemispheres. Right now, we're seeing equal activity around the clock in Southern and Northern hemisphere countries. So it's harder uh, to acknowledge that, in fact, this is just about uh, the seasonality. What people don't realize right now, for example, up through the past several weeks, the highest incidence in the world has actually been in the Southern Hemisphere in uh, the countries of Uruguay, Paraguay, uh, Chile, uh, and in Peru. Uh, so that uh, the even higher incidence than we've seen in India. So we have seen this rather precipitous drop uh, starting in, in uh, January, coming down into February, a possible surge in April, which I'll come back to in a moment, where we saw very limited but very highly uh, concentrated activity in the country uh, here. 
So when we look at where we're at today, my slide is frozen. Let's see if I can, there we go. Uh, let me start out by talking about the modeling of COVID-19, the unknowns. There are at least three really important unknowns that we have to deal with. Pandemic public health measures, what do they really do for us? What, what, what difference do they make? Uh, you'll talk, see in a moment, I'll lay those out for you. How about the variants of concern? Until November, we didn't realize that these mutated virus strains actually had very important health and public health implications. Prior to November, we kind of described these, uh, these mutations as almost the same car, but one was blue, one was red, one was yellow, and one was green of no real consequence. We know now that's not true. And then of course the vaccines have arrived. Again, pointing out here the, uh, the attention that we've had in each of these, remember that almost all the activity we're talking about to date has occurred prior to the advent of, of the uh, variants in the United States. The January peak at this point, we had no evidence had anything to do with variants. So everything left of that uh, was pre-variant. Pre now the challenge is understanding what variants mean going forward. This is an example of what I'm talking about in terms of I don't understand it. Uh, these are the case numbers here for mid-April in the United States. As you may recall, that was when Minnesota and Michigan, particularly Michigan, were in a sense houses on fire. Uh, Michigan actually exceeded the case numbers and the number of persons hospitalized in April than they had in that November peak that we talked about. Minnesota came close to those numbers. Uh, and I have never in my career witnessed a situation where we saw very rapidly surging numbers of cases in two states and not the whole country. New York had had an ongoing high incidence of disease that was coming down at this time, New York, New Jersey. Uh, and otherwise nationwide case numbers, as you saw in that epi curve, just kept dropping. Because of this, the question is, what happened? If you look at Michigan, you can go to the immediate east of that in Canada, and they too were having a very significant challenge, uh, as were Minnesota. We believe this was largely driven by uh, the variant B117. I'll come back to that in a moment. But explain to me why the rest of the country didn't light up. I've never seen that. Indiana, a state with, uh, at that time, one of the lower vaccination rates in the country of mid-April, very little activity, even though they were adjacent to this. This makes no sense. Uh, if you look at influenza epidemiology, look at the respiratory pathogen epidemiology, I've never seen anything like this before where you can have such hot, hot, hot activity somewhere and close by virtually nothing in the rest of the, rest of the country. We'll come back to this. If you look at a place like India, I could go through a number of different countries, India, Sweden, even now today, Taiwan, where everyone talks about the fact, well, if you just did it like they did it, it would be so much better. And I have probably heard no fewer than a thousand times in the course of the last year, well, look how India is controlling this. Aren't they doing a great job? You know, after you look at the data up till early April, you could say, yeah, that's true. But I've learned all too much to say, no, just give it a couple more months and see what happens. And you can see here what has happened in India. You're well aware of this very rapid increase that occurred in uh, beginning in March. And this is where we think the variants of concern may have played a role uh, in particular in terms of this transmission. So what are we talking about when we talk about public health measures? We're talking about non-pharmaceutical interventions, including contact tracing, testing, quarantine, isolation, masking, and distancing. Uh, of all of these, uh, the latter two have really received the most attention and the strongest recommendations. Why do we shut things down so we can distance people? You know, why do we ask people not to go to work so we can distance people? They don't get exposed to someone. And masking, of course, is, is what it is. Masking has become a, an issue that is both uh, scientifically and politically charged, uh, to say the least. Uh, and I always, anytime giving a talk like this, have some trepidation about even addressing this issue because any information I share will definitely be used by some uh, uh, inappropriately to make a, a political point and others uh, who are, are upset and angry that they believe in certain kinds of activities uh, almost as if somehow uh, because they believe it is true. Let me give you an example on the issue of masking. Um, when this all started, we understood early on, the, the number of us, that this was an airborne transmitted agent, an aerosol. 
uh, it only took until more recently for the WHO and CDC to readily acknowledge that that transmission was critical. There we know that these tiny particles uh, basically are very difficult to contain or very difficult to prevent from being inhaled. Uh, we always start at the administrative level with ventilation, et cetera, to improve. But this, these are data from uh, Lisa Brosau at, here at the University of Minnesota at SIDRAP uh, based on CDC work that was done in NIOSH, looking at the inward leakage uh, to the receptor of the individual mask, or on the left, you'll see outward leakage. And so basically, if you look at what would be considered an infectious dose, meaning the amount of time it would take you to be adjacent to someone, if two people were together in that upper left-hand corner for 15 minutes with no face piece on, that would be sufficient time based on the CDC work to say that would be an, uh, an inhalation of an infectious dose. Remember, time and concentration are important here. It's not just do you wear or not wear. But if you look at the face cloth coverings, uh, gaiters, uh, cloth mask, or procedure mask, all ones that have substantial leakage, uh, they're not meant to be tight face fitting like a surgical uh, or uh, uh, a face piece respirator. And what you see here is that if two people wore cloth masks, both the inward leakage and outward leakage, and the prevention is only about uh, the fa about 45% basically protection, you would have an infectious dose, two people wearing a cloth mask in the same room in 51 minutes. If you go to the right there, you can see that. If you have a procedure mask on, the surgical mask is 56 minutes. You know, there's no evidence here that, we, in particular because we've done so little to deal with time and dose, that we really have evidence that masking like this, if I were in the workplace all day or in a crowded bar or whatever, would provide substantial protection beyond those initial minutes. It's like a seatbelt. You know, seatbelts in of themselves may not save you in a car accident, but together with collapsible bodies, airbags, uh, fractured glass, all those are safety measures that collectively have a big impact on how your outcome is in an automobile crash. Well, here, uh, you know, you can surely reduce the time to an infectious dose of two people wearing cloth masks with the leakage that occurs around the sides. Uh, but over time, two or three hours, you still have your infectious dose. Whereas if you're wearing an N95 filtering face piece respirator, you can look at the bottom of each one, you can go 417 hours before you would be expected to inhale or actually exhale out an infectious dose. And I think that that's something that's been missed here. We keep talking about masking as if somehow it's one simple uh, thing. And uh, we'll come back to that in the modeling because modeling has just, do you wear a mask or don't you wear a mask? I've never seen anybody actually just tell you, well, what protection does that provide you? How much time uh, you know, are you in that setting? You know, if I'm in a room right now, a small room, and somebody starts to smoke, I can tell you if I'm wearing a cloth mask, a gaiter, or even a procedure mask, I'll smell that smoke quickly. That's in fact inhaling an infectious dose. Uh, as I pointed out, CDC just this past week finally has uh, understood uh, the issue around the airborne threat and aerosols. And the fact that even with an aerosol, airborne viruses can be inhaled even more than six feet away. There is nothing magical about a six foot distance. Surely concentration decreases over time. But if you put a number of people in a small room uh, and one of those individuals is infected over time, the amount of virus will continue to just accumulate, just like the smoke I talked about. Uh, if you're in a small room and someone's smoking over time, that room will become smoke filled. So again, uh, I've seen too much modeling uh, where there is no real emphasis placed on what kind of respiratory protection are we talking about by the device, by the amount of time and the concentration. This is a, uh, an ongoing series of papers from Roger uh, Chu and group uh, in Oregon, which has been funded by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And they have actually been doing a very extensive and a very thoughtful, scientifically sound review of masks for prevention of respiratory virus infections, including SARS-CoV-2 in both healthcare and community settings. And basically what they have concluded as of to date is many studies that have come out that are talking about how mask use decreases the uh, risk of transmission either to or from an infected individual to a susceptible individual. Uh, they basically say other strength of evidence ratings related to mask use in community settings were unchanged because of no new evidence. 
And those previous conclusions were that there has not yet been demonstrated effectiveness shown with use of these masks. Now, this is not politically uh, something that people want to hear, but again, uh, I would say to you that uh, the kinds of studies where with cloth face coverings, gaiters, et cetera, will you know, likely reduce your risk for a period of time uh, to some degree. So please know that I still am supportive of using whatever respiratory protection you can get. But remember, it's about time and dose. And so in the modeling studies, this, is, this has been totally neglected. And, uh, and I think this has been a big challenge. Then we get into the variance of concern. Uh, P1, which was first discovered in Brazil and uh, was at the heart of the lo very large resurgence of activity in Manaus, Brazil. Uh, B135, which was the uh, variant that was seen first in South Africa, has uh, had impact on several of the vaccine trials were done there. B117, first seen in, uh, in Southern England, uh, now has spread around the world. Uh, this is one for which we clearly have seen increased transmissibility, increased disease severity, and impact on diagnostics, treatments, or vaccines, fortunately, has not yet occurred. And then B1617, the new variant from India, where I'll show you in a moment, it's now even 617.1, 617.2, and 617.3, where there may be all three of these reasons for concern that will be very important. How do you factor this in and with its transmission uh, around the world uh, suddenly with this increased transmissibility? Take, for example, this paper here. Uh, I call this the Ferguson Group. I have very high respect for Neil Ferguson and the colleagues that they work with here in pulling together, looking at B117. And I draw your attention to that last sentence where it basically talks about the fact that B117 has a substantial transmission advantage over other lineages with a 50 to 100% higher reproduction number. And our experience here in this country is absolutely that's true to a degree. And what I mean by that is we have seen B117 come, we've seen it spread widely, we've seen it become a predominant uh, variant, and yet we've only seen limited activity in, in many states and only very few like Michigan and Minnesota, we've seen kind of almost house on fire moments. If you look at the CDC's uh, modeling work to look at what might be a B117 lineage emergence, uh, these were, this was published uh, back in, in late December, early January. Uh, it was a, a warning, which we actually, I agreed with. I thought that the information based on what we saw with B117 spreading through uh, Europe and the challenges they had with literally total lockdowns in a number of countries, the impact this had on England, um, and if you look here, what this is, is based on a reproductive number of 1.1 on January 1st with no vaccine or one of 0.9 with no vaccine below what would happen uh, with reproductive number 1.1 with vaccination. It was not clear what vaccination meant in terms of the actual uh, number and uh, how the vaccinations were distributed by age uh, and geographic location. But the point being here is if you had a reproductive number of 1.1, uh, on January uh, 1st with, with no vaccine, you can see how, uh, in this case, the variant basically took off, which is the total is the gray, and you can see the other variants decreasing, B117 taking off, that lighter colored. It was even more pronounced down in the uh, issue there with, uh, um, um, in terms of no vaccine, I'm sorry, the vaccine protection was more well demonstrated. I mean, uh, if you look at the one with reproduction of 1.1 with vaccination, uh, and you can still see that B11 would become the predominant uh, 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 variant. Now, given what we just said about the higher uh, transmissibility of this virus, uh, you know, this was of grave concern. What would happen? Well, overall, population wise, these are data from the group uh, in, uh, uh, in Scripps. Uh, Christian Anderson's group basically showing that over time, as we got into, uh, the, you can see B117 became really the predominant uh, variant that we have in this case, a variant of concern in this country. Based on that, wouldn't we have expected to see much more widespread transmission? Well, look what we got. Michigan was hot. Its adjoining area in Canada was hot. Minnesota was fairly hot. Uh, we've seen some uh, additional activity in Oregon since then much of the rest of the country, nothing happened. Is this 
uh, uh, meaning that B117 is not important when we saw it really become the predominant uh, variant around the country. This is one of those none of us can tell you. We don't know. We don't understand this. For all I know, it's going to be like Florida, where last uh, September they opened up after their big July peak. Uh, the governor made a very strong case for that they were done with COVID, that they had hit their herd immunity. And this went on through October, it went on through November, it went on through December. And then they lit up in January. And by mid-January, the third of the ICU uh, units in Florida were filled. Um, you know, why for four months nothing happened? Why did nothing happen in India? We don't understand this. And anyone who tries to model this has to understand we don't understand this. This is the B16, uh, 617.12 and 3. The new ones have just have emerged in India. Uh, these are ones that uh, we actually are seeing in some locations is out competing B117 now. Uh, how much this has actually contributed to the big peaking cases in India is unclear. But because of that, how do you model this? How, how do you understand when a, a variant is going to take off and what it will do? I just got done showing you in, you know, in Europe, B117 was a nightmare. In the United States, if you're in Michigan, Minnesota, it was a nightmare. But if you're in a lot of places, it wasn't. Why? If you look at the India map here, is that the explanation for the big cases, the variants? We don't know. So if you're going to model this, you need to at least understand we don't know why these cases suddenly took off uh, and, and what that means. Uh, Eric Topol, who is uh, someone with I have great respect for, who heads up script, actually talked about the variants and are all innocent until proven guilty and what they can do. Are they more likely to be super spreaders as such? And I think B117 has proven that, and yet I've also seen areas where B117 is present and very limited activity. We don't understand these. In terms of vaccines, I don't need to say much more. You already know about the, particularly the mRNA vaccines, the adenovirus vaccines. Uh, they have been nothing short of modern medical miracles. If we look at these, these again are data from uh, modeling at CDC. Looking at what would happen, uh, the far left is uh, basically looking at doses there from low vaccination to low, with um, low uh, non pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, low vaccination, moderate non-pharmaceutical interventions, high vaccination, low NPI. You can see the different combinations. Let me tell you, I don't know what low NPI means. I don't understand that. Um, again, how efficient is masking? What does distancing mean? Is it just a series of recommendations or is it mandates that governors put out? How do you measure that? Also, what do you call high and low vaccination? There was no description in this paper that really allowed you to understand what this meant. And yet we have taken a tremendous number of assumptions here and put them into data uh, like this, which has led to a lot of national policy decisions. Maybe this is true. This may very well be what's happening. But at the same time, I don't know. If you look at states in the country right now, there is such difference by who, how many people are getting vaccinated per day and where the, the assumption of vaccination is at. If you look at that lower left quadrant, this is on the left side, you'll see their share of adult populations received at least one dose of vaccine. You will see on the bottom is the daily rate of immunizations per 100,000 persons. Look at all those states in the South in particular, the red ones that are there. Very low levels of vaccination overall and very low level of new vaccinees being brought into the pool. Now, that group has to be ripe for additional activity. Every one of those are in a position not that dissimilar from where we were when Michigan and Minnesota took off. And so you can't argue that vaccination of itself would be sufficient to stop a surge. It didn't stop it in Michigan at the level of vaccination they had, and it didn't stop it in Minnesota. So why are those states not lighting up? I don't know. Again, the variability we can't explain. Also, the va vaccines do show promise against the variants uh, overall, but we're still understanding that. What will B1351 uh, do? What will the vaccines uh, do against the new Indian variant? And we're still trying to understand that, given that we do know that they have specific mutations at the spike protein, uh, at, the, at the spike level. There's been a lot of interpretation of data about Israel and, and England in terms of what's happened. Uh, if you see here new infections, uh, you can see the first fall peak that occurred, both infections and deaths were not as high as the second peak. 
that occurred starting in January, largely associated with B117 present. Now, the numbers came down precipitously while a vaccine campaign was going on, and this was attributed that the vac that vaccine levels at even 60%, one dose, brought these numbers down. I just also remind you that in, and uh, at that time, Israel was in total lockdown. So how much contribution the lockdown make together with the vaccine, we don't know. You can't conclude, basically, that vaccine of itself did this. While I have no doubt vaccine has been very important, we can't con to know that contribution. If you look at the United Kingdom, and particularly England, the same very thing happened. You had a less uh, of a peak occurring uh, in uh, the time period in, or, uh, early uh, in the year, like they saw in Israel. But then once B117 took off, you saw new infections, uh, you saw deaths rise uh, substantially. And again, the same challenge that we have in Israel, we can't understand for certain what contribution the vaccine made at one dose and what at the same time the lockdowns did to get us there. Both countries today have, have very low numbers and the combination surely of lockdown and vaccinations made that happen. But here's, a, uh, I think, a, a very important uh, warning. Uh, why the country's most vaccinated, why the world's most vaccinated country is seeing an unprecedented spike in coronavirus cases. This is the Seychelles. They have the highest proportion of a population vaccinated in the world. 131 doses per 100 residents, 70% have received more than one dose, 61% are fully vaccinated. Meaning that, uh, so that the 70% would have the single dose, they are using only two dose of vaccines there. Uh, the Sinopharm vaccine and the ASV, the, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine that was manufactured in India. Uh, these have been, the Sinopharm vaccine has been approved by WHO, and it appears at this point that the vaccines are doing quite well, maybe not as high as we'd expect to see with an mRNA vaccine. But if you look at the rolling day average there of new cases for this country of 100,000, they've gone from 120 to 314 cases over the last two weeks. 37% of the cases have received two doses. 80% of the hospitalizations are among the unvaccinated. So even this small group of people who are unvaccinated are still causing a major challenge. Why are we not seeing this in the United States? Will we see it? Maybe we will in the weeks ahead. How do you anticipate that? How do you model it? So let me just quickly conclude by just going through a couple of models to share with you some of my concerns and what I think is surely a challenge going forward and what do models do or not do. I've already expressed my extreme uh, 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 admiration for the group at Imperial College, but even looking here at what happened early on in their work, this was the study behind the virus report that jarred the US and UK into action. There was no doubt about that. Uh, I know that there were many people who worked on this uh, through Imperial College. Uh, many of us associate this with Neil, so I don't wanna not give credit to all those who have worked on it. Uh, but we often have referred to this as the uh, Ferguson Report. And if you look here, what you see basically uh, is this very, very high number of deaths per 100,000 population, cases per 100,000 in the United States. And if you look at these numbers, actually over time, you'll see that we miss these by a long, long shot. If you look at cases per 100,000 population, we were at a substantially higher level in both of these in terms of the actual trajectory of number of cases um, and uh, such that it was almost uh, four to five times higher uh, than what was actually seen here. If we look at, and, and I'm gonna come back to that later because that actually also has implications for how uh, people interpret what we were talking about in terms of happening. If you look at the Minnesota Department of Health closer at home, uh, this particular uh, study, uh, modeling study was published on the 16th of April. And uh, what you see here, and this is 2020, is uh, this is four different really scenarios with a sub scenario 3.1, 3.2. This has to do uh, in terms of uh, uh, the orders, the stay at home orders, whether they were kept in place, whether they were not kept in place, extending physical distancing, uh, all these different issues. Let me summarize it here. In each of the scenarios, if you look at the point estimates, it went from 20,000 to 50,000, but extended up as high as 68,000 in the confidence interval of scenario one. I point this out because this is what the public sees. This is what the politicians see. I have had to live with this uh, model 
since the beginning of the pandemic as us in public health greatly exaggerating the risk. Because in fact, if you look at the end of March 22nd, which they had projected, we're at 6,782 deaths. And, and uh, for all the reasons that I understand why the model was done, uh, the assumptions that were made, but there are downsides to this kind of information. Because I, I can tell you day after day after day, I am confronted by those uh, on certain po par, uh, political persuasions, people wanting to make the case that public health has exaggerated the risk of this the whole time. Don't, don't think about the fact that 6,782 deaths is a remarkable challenge and a public health failure. But what they focus on are these numbers for which they were put out and, and, not, and not ever really addressed since. If you look at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, the University of Washington, this has been a group that has surely challenged us in terms of what they've done. Um, this is one here where they forecasted on March 26 that U.S. hospitals could be overwhelmed in the second week of April. And they made it seem as if it was the entire country's hospitals. And as I pointed out to you, it is just a, uh, a, a very limited number of hospitals. Most of the country had little to no activity at the time. But at the time that this was put out, it was part of what, in a sense, scared people into we're shutting down everything everywhere in the absence of actual cases. And if you look at uh, this issue today and uh, look back in retrospect, they weren't that far off in the numbers. There was 130,000 deaths by the, uh, by the end of June. So it was higher than this. But the point was, is that, again, it geographically was not at all distributed as they suggested. If you look at uh, their forecasts show that more than 200,000 deaths by November 1st, <clears throat> note how far out they're forecasting. They actually continue to forecast out uh, literally months. But more importantly, they now have incorporated mask wearing. I have no clue how you incorporate mask wearing into your model. I already went through the challenges with mask wearing. I already went through the issues of how well they protect or don't protect. I also went through the issue of time and dose. Uh, and uh, again, something as simple, if you're wearing a face cloth covering, we have data showing that a fourth of all the people in this country wear it under their nose, more as a diaper for their chin as than a foes for trying to reduce transmission. How do you factor this in? And so one of the challenges has been now we're seeing models incorporating various interventions in with, I got to tell you, really not a lick of data that supports how those interventions really work. Uh, universal mask could save 130,000 lives by the end of February. I just think this kind of a statement's irresponsible. Uh, it, it gives people a sense of protection, much like we did with hygiene theater. We basically scared this country into at every surface was a potential source for the transmission of this virus. Today, as you've seen, both WHL and the CDC have backed off that completely. And uh, we've called it hygiene theater, but it's the same kind of issue here uh, in terms of the public. We've basically told the public we can save their lives by using a cloth face covering. You already have seen the data on that issue. Uh, and we've seen a lot of pushback. Uh, this is the late Sharon Beagley who wrote this uh, in April of last year. It's unfortunate she's no longer with us. In which, in fact, you see uh, Mark Lipsich, uh, one of my colleagues and a respected colleague, says it's not a model that most of us in the infectious disease epidemiology field think is suited to projecting COVID-19 deaths. Yet, this is the one model that keeps getting cited over and over again in the media as the definitive number. I mean, I can tell you when a new report comes out, it's the hot headline news. And I think this is terribly unfortunate. Um, if you look at this, this is one this past week where COVID has caused more than 6.9 million deaths globally, more than double what official reports show. This has received major attention. Uh, obviously, if it's true, we want to know that and we want to understand how it was, how it was obtained. But again, then when you look at, this is a paper by Stephen Wolf and colleagues. It was published uh, earlier this year. Uh, and uh, he's from the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, University here. And when you look at uh, their uh, paper and what they did looking literally uh, by the, each state, looking at excess deaths, and then this comment, this appeared this past week in British Medical Journal, uh, where COVID-19 study claims real global deaths are twice official figures. Well, this is the same Stephen Wolf who just did the previous paper, which I think many of us would agree was very thoughtfully done. And he said the lead author of the research, Stephen Wolf, criticized IHME's new figures. Their estimate of excess deaths is enormous and inconsistent with our research and others, he told Public Radio. 
There are a lot of assumption educated guests built into their model. Today, the IMHE model has driven so much of the national international conversation. And yet time and time again, I hear about all the flaws and the significant challenges there, the long periods projecting months and months out. And yet there's only a limited number of people who have really stood up to this issue. Let me just close with the last model, which I think actually represents some of the best work, the ensemble model from the CDC. The CDC has been working with partners to predict cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Uh, they, they, at this point, basically have used different types of data, COVID-19 data, demographic data, mobility data, methods and estimates of the impacts of the interventions, uh, trying to incorporate what they can into this. They've been developed independently and shared publicly. An ensemble forecast combines each of the independently developed forecasts into one aggregate forecast to improve prediction over the next four weeks, four weeks. Uh, 28 models are currently represented in the current case projections, and 36 models are represented in the number of death projections. And this is what you get. On the left, you see the variability both for deaths and weekly up, uh, we, new weekly deaths, total deaths. And then what you see on the right is by bringing together all of those different estimates, you get that red line, which I think really represents a much more responsible way, both in terms of the amount of time and while things could change, and even here, the CDC acknowledges this project that a sharp decline in cases are likely, but variants are a wild card. We don't know. I think this level of definition is really very, very important in terms of helping the public understand these could change. This is our best guesstimate that these could change. I just want to leave you with one last piece here because I think this is uh, uh, an example I've also had to live with. I was very involved with the issue of Ebola in Africa in 2014 and 15. And you may note in here that uh, down uh, second line, the initial estimates were that in the absence of any increased interventions or changes in human behavior, by December 27th, 2014, there would be approximately 226,000 cumulative cases in Liberia. This was a CDC estimate that came out. This is our CDC report. By that date, however, there were only 8,000 reported cumulative cases in Liberia. Meanwhile, if you look at for Sierra Leone and Guinea, in both of those cases, the cumulative number of cases were actually quite close to what WHO approximated they would be. How could WHO be so close in theirs and CDC be so far off? Well, again, I got to tell you, I've been living with that 226,000 number. When you testify before Congress, you're talking to elected officials. They said, well, look at how bad you made that back then. That wasn't real. 226,000 cases, and in fact, it was only at that point you know, 8,000 cases. So these numbers have Im living impact. And many of us in the policy side have to clean this up day after day after day where we're confronted with this when there's not more attention paid to the methods, the variability, how much can you explain? So let me just conclude by saying there are several recent commentaries on this. This is one from a year ago, uh, predictive mathematical models of COVID-19 pandemic. And you can see in predicting the future of COVID-19 pandemic, many key assumptions have been based on limited data. And that continues, that continues. This particular New England Journal paper, I think was really a very important effort. Uh, there are five specific questions here that I think need to be asked about the models and constantly being reviewed. What is the purpose and time frame of this model? Uh, second of all, what are the basic model assumptions? Third, how is uncertainty being displayed? Fourth, if the model is fitted to data, which data are used? And uh, I can't quite see this one because my uh, uh, word, the, the lines are, there you go. Um, is the model, I'll quiet for a second, then I'll watch. Is the model general, does it reflect a particular context? And I think that's uh, the key here. So I hope that this discussion does help people see just what the variability and the epidemiology of the disease brings in terms of how reliable and helpful is the modeling. So my final slide and recommendations, modeling as a public health tool can be helpful or detrimental to our response to epidemics and pandemic events. Assumptions, 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 what are they? How are they made? If you're gonna use uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions as part of your outcome uh, impact measure, how did you do it? What, what data do you have? What is the variability around it? How do you communicate variability? I'm tired of basically having to defend that there are uh, gonna be 822,614 cases of X in two months. 
that precision that is given by those kinds of numbers is lost in much of the public. They see it as some kind of, well, you know what you're really talking about. We see it as obviously stressing the data, stretching the data far beyond what you can. Finally, understanding the strengths and limitations of modeling, we need to really address that. I think that's a huge issue. Uh, I don't say get rid of it. I just say we have to understand that. And then finally, last but not least, is public, public message and communication. How do we get this out? Why do we have to keep dealing publicly with one or two models out there that have historically and routinely given us information that uh, at best is severely challenged? So with that, uh, Dan, I'll turn it back over to you and just thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you. I appreciate it very, very much. Wow, thank you. Yeah, this this is really useful um, for me, and um, I appreciate the the uh, level of humility, you know, and, uh, that's important in um, bringing these types of messages forward to the public and to the media. Um, and uh, I, I see this as the <laughs> beginning of a conversation, you know, that that needs to be continued. Um, and I think this message needs to get out. So I'm so appreciative that you were willing to share that today well thank you for allowing us and again i take responsibility for all the mistakes here so but uh, i think this is the beginning of a dialogue that i think would be very helpful